Well, it's time for the latest shine on Oklahoma music with Brian Maughan, who most of you know is County Commissioner Brian Maughan in Oklahoma County. But this series is really something special, Brian. Thanks for doing it. We're glad to bring it to the viewers and give Oklahoma some history. You know, this one in particular is going to be a really great episode, Scott. It has Gloria Thomas, the widow of B.J. Thomas, a native from Hugo, Oklahoma, of course, a Grammy winner and just an iconic singer throughout the 70s and 80s and uh, had a career spectrum that went from the 60s actually all the way up till his death just a couple of years ago. This is the first interview that she has granted since his passing, and we are excited that she chose us to share his life story. Well, anybody who is, you know, anybody that was around during the 70s and 80s and 90s knows B.J. Thomas. If you're a movie fan, you know B.J. Thomas, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, Raindrops Falling on My Head, you know, is a part of a huge movie, movie soundtrack. But what you'll also get out of this deal is a different perspective than when you're talking with the artists themselves, because this is the love story. Their over 50 year marriage uh, is just really one for the books. OK, and you said a, a native of Hugo. I think our second one that will be coming up soon is going to be Susie McIntyre. Now we're talking about down in Adair County. So there's some real musical talent from that part of the set. Another lady also from the McIntyre family. I think most people know her name as well. Yes, absolutely. Susie McIntyre in the Gospel Music Hall of Fame and also, of course, had a career alongside her sister Reba, but then also was just given distinction a couple of years ago by being inducted into the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame and really is a standalone just of her own. She's worked with uh, the uh, Jesus Talk series, which is a very popular devotional book, and she has done a number of other projects, which uh, just made her a delight. And the unique thing about that, there again, with like the Gloria Thomas, you know, a love story, she's on with her husband, Mark, who manages her and plays with her on the stage. And so you get the two of them together with an interaction about how their lives work on the road and her historic music career. Okay, that's episode two. But coming up is episode one. And you know, here it is, Brian Mon doing Shine on Oklahoma Music, a different way most Oklahomans have seen you, Commissioner, but thanks for doing this. So here's episode one right now. Gloria Thomas here to give us an interview. I think very one of the very rare ones that she's done since his untimely passing. We sure appreciate it, and we certainly loved your husband and so proud of him mm -hmm. with his Oklahoma roots. Born in Hugo, Oklahoma. A lot of people mm -hmm. don't know that. Yeah. Uh, did he ever talk to you much about his Oklahoma roots? I know he was just here briefly. He, he was he he was there as a child. He came, he went back to Hugo a few times to look around and look at the house that um, he stayed at. His his mother uh, came to be with family when uh, it was time for BJ to be born, and um, and so she he was only there for a few weeks, but. You know, it changed his, uh, it, um, you know, he was raised in Texas and uh, he, could, he thought of himself as a Texas artist, but then he embraced his Oklahoma roots. <laughs> well, we certainly claim him, that's for sure. Yeah. And so uh, you're coming to us from Mexico, right? San Miguel uh, de Allende, Mexico. Wow. So how did you come about to live there? Well, BJ and I both were going to come here, and um, and then COVID happened, and then he got sick, and as we talked, he said, well, why don't you just go on? You know, uh, friends that he, uh, he's had since he was a teenager live here, and uh, but I've, I've met and made so many friends here, and it's an unusual, interesting group of people, and I just love it here. Well, good for you. Well, we're so happy for your um, new home and glad that you're able to go on and enjoy life. Let's just kind of start backwards, if you don't mind. Okay. I mean, he has such right. an expansive career. Mm -hmm. uh, here towards the end of what turned out to be his life, he did some living room sessions. Were those yeah. the last recordings that he did? They were. They were the last studio recordings that he did. Um, one of the things that I did, because... He is on uh, CMG now, um, a legacy uh, agency. And uh, what I did was I searched down all unreleased masters on him and I 
found a bunch of them. And in that, I found a Christmas song called Merry Christmas Baby. And when I listen to it, it sounds like a hit to me. And <laughs> um, I, I hopefully we're going to get that out. Oh, how exciting. So even though it was recorded some years ago, it, it's just beautiful. Well, of course, his voice is timeless. I, I think it's like Sinatra, you know, it'll just transcend all yeah. kinds of generations. And he was yeah. so, so giving to come back to Oklahoma. I met him on a couple of occasions. Yeah. And one of which was when he just came back to be honored by our local chamber of commerce and right. received the Native Son Award. And uh, I just remember that evening, he would go out around the crowd. He was just out mixing and mingling and everybody was just jaw dropping that he was so accessible. Such he a was, nice man. He was such a nice man. He was kind and and kind hearted and loving. He, uh, he he was a wonderful man. He was a great singer. That guy could sing. Oh, sure could. Well, then, how long were you married to BJ? Fifty-two and a half years. I knew it was a long time. <laughs> yes. How did you first meet? Um, you know, I used to. Go. I used to dance. It was in Houston. So a group of friends and I would get together and we'd go to the places that had live music and we would dance. And um, sometimes he would perform there. And uh, one, one night I was sitting at the table and there he was. And um, he said that the moment he saw me, <laughs> it was over for him. <laughs> <laughs> I had been through a windshield though. So um, I wasn't in the mood, you know. Um, so, it, it, you know, I, I left. I just said, you know, I left. And it took him a couple hours to find out where I lived and he came rapping on my door. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So did you have a quick engagement or was it a long engagement? A year. We were engaged for a year and uh, we got married in Las Vegas and we did three promotion gigs on our honeymoon. <laughs> it was like so, an initiation into the business. For the viewers, put us in context of where he was in his career at that time. He had had, uh, I'm so lonesome and mama and Billy and Sue and those in those. And, uh, I, he was, he left while we were dating to go to Memphis to Chip's moment in the American studio group. And uh, they came up with Hooked on a Feeling and uh, a few others. And um, we, we scheduled getting married a few times and we had to change it. So we had, he had three days and we went to Las Vegas and got married and um, we hit the road after that. <laughs> Success was kind of getting in the way, I imagine. Well, it, you know, it's hard to schedule anything when you're a touring artist. Right. So uh, a quick, did you go on a honeymoon? Well, our life was a honeymoon in a way. I traveled with him for, you know, the, the, off and on the, his whole career. But I was out there for about 25 years um, at one point. And... Um, you know, we, we went around the world a few times, you know, and all over the United States. And, um, and, and a honeymoon, you know, I, I guess Vegas was kind of a honeymoon, but, uh -huh. uh, and then he went, to, we went to work, you know. Um, Did uh, you have any kind of a role inside of his music operation? Were you a part of the business side or ever I, on the I, I was. After a few years, I basically, um, I was a big part of, of his business. And uh, we had in-house management. After about seven or eight years, we had in-house management. And we had a staff and all that. And um, we took care of things. Uh, and and I'm, I'm a songwriter, so, you know, I wrote a lot of his uh, album cuts and um, I wrote one song that was number one country, New Looks from an Old Lover, with Red Lane and Lathan Hudson. And, um, uh, but that was a long time ago. 
you know. <laughs> Are you uh, still writing today? Well, you know, I took a big break, I, you know, working and writing. Um, I took a big break, but I've been, I've been writing a lot lately. Good for you. So do you have artists that are uh, in mind to pitch them to, or how does that work? Well, I, there's a guy, Billy Herzig, that's back in Texas, and I really like working with him. And we started um, working on a song. We haven't, you know, I got, I became so busy, but working on a song about seeds, seeds of love, seeds of kindness. They say breadfruit and jackfruit will uh, could get the world through uh, climate change. And I, and I thought, well, you know, I, I want to write a song about, you know, feeding people is, is like loving people and, and, and that we can be kind. It's kindness is so underrated and love is all there is. And so um, I saw where Billy called me or texted me and I got to get back with him. Um, we'll finish it. it yeah. Takes, it, well, you know, this is probably a good segue to mention another time that I met BJ was when he came in and for me, <clears throat> I have a shine program uh -huh. and instead of uh, being sentenced to jail for low rate offenses, they're sentenced uh -huh. instead to work on our public works crews. Oh, I'm a county commissioner. And so oh, they go out good. and help us clean up the community. But one of the things that we've gotten into was community gardens. And so we're doing a lot oh, of that. Good. That so is he, wonderful. If it makes you feel better from seeds that he sowed, if you will, uh, a few years ago when he did that concert for us, it actually is part of the money that is paying for these community gardens and we're having them all over the metro area of Oklahoma City. Goosebumps. I love that. It's a big part of our new program. So we go out and put the uh, gardens in and kind of use these shine crews to go help do that. And then we have a number of um, community volunteers that are joining mm -hmm. in, master gardeners, 4-H mm -hmm. kids, and a lot of stuff like that. So in a way, he really helped do that. And that's what I was going to segue into is that he was just so giving and he gave back to our community yeah. and he just very generously came in and agreed to yeah. do it because we created a government program, but we didn't necessarily have the funds to run it. And so yeah. we raised donations through a series of shine concerts and Wanda Jackson did our first one mm -hmm. and Merle Haggard did our second one. And our very third one was done by none other than BJ Thomas. So we wow. were, we were a baby organization at that yeah. time and he really helped us get on the map. Well, I love that. I didn't know that exactly. And uh, that just gives me goosebumps. I love it. Well, I'm, I'm so appreciative. Thanks for sharing him with us. And I know that time at that time was being time away from you. You weren't able to make it for that show you told me. So I also wanted to say that that night, though, coincidentally, we were able to work out at the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame had not been able to previously schedule a mm -hmm. night to induct him. And so it mm -hmm. became, I believe, the first time that they ever deviated from their a uh, annual banquet where they have inductions mm -hmm. and decided to do a one-off if you will at the end of our shine concert and he was able to be finally overdue i might add inducted into the oklahoma I, music hall of fame i do remember that i know it meant a lot to him well if we don't have the uh, the hall of fame induction award but i wanted to point out that uh, you had made it possible for us to be able to get back the award he was given oh. that night from the Shine oh. Foundation. And I appreciate Go after ahead. he passed away, you made this available to us to enshrine. And oh, we have that enshrined here at our office. And we're so grateful for that. Thank you. I know yeah. that a friend of mine is picking up a Texas CMA award uh, in Lubbock. And so it, it's going to go to um, um, the Texas Country Music Hall of Fame. You know, the, the reason I wanted to place these awards in, in places is that I knew I was coming to Mexico and I didn't want something to happen to me and then they just go by the wayside. Mm -hmm. So his awards are in the, the Country Music Hall of Fame, the Texas Country Music Hall of Fame, uh, yours and um, family members have three of the Grammys and one of the Grammys is in Country Music Hall of Fame. And Connie Nelson is a really good friend right. of mine. And uh, she's helped me get 
some of them placed. Well, thank you again for being so benevolent and sharing with us. Now, did you and BJ have children? We have three daughters, three grown daughters. Tell us a little bit about your kids. One of them is a school teacher. One of them works for rehab centers. And um, the other one is married and has two beautiful children. I wanted to ask because, you know, it's hard to sometimes know about the personal side of the artist and they are very important to his life yeah. and legacy, of course. And, right. you know, we've only gotten to talk to a couple of the family members of those Oklahoma stars that have passed on. Uh -huh. And so uh, and one of the things that we try to achieve in doing this is to make sure that their life story is preserved for the Oklahoma History Center, where these right. will ultimately be archived. And so among the things that you think that, um, were important might vary from what he thought was, but between the two of you, what do you think are some of the career highlights? Obviously, Raindrops Falling on My Head is is a massive, timeless song. It rates right up there in my yes. mind with like New York and crazy. Yes. But well, uh, what I do think, you think? I think our time, uh, when we were first married, we lived in Memphis and BJ recorded there. And then we moved to New York City to... Um, um, with where Scepter Records was, and um, it, it just it just set his career in motion. Our days in New York, and and then you you sort of have to go back south if you're a southerner, and that's what we did. And um, I, I think that um, in the some of the last years, he worked Carnegie Hall with um, Jimmy Webb, mm -hmm. and with a, a bunch of people. And, I think he really enjoyed doing that. Um, he's had so many, you know, he, uh, um, he's been honored in a hundred different ways. And um, he had, he's had hit songs throughout his entire career, mm -hmm. you know, country, pop and gospel. Right. Is there so, any award that eludes you that you think on his behalf he should still be bestowed? Well, I like the CMA um, Lifetime Achievement Award um, because, you know, he really wasn't a Nashville artist until later in his career. And um, but, you know, he he could sing. He has a jazz album, a Brazilian jazz album that just would, this, this Christmas song is, is the, the, just one of the best Christmas songs I've ever heard. You know, I hope we get it out. Oh, uh, me too. Can't wait to hear it. Yeah. It's, you know, I'll send you a copy if you'd like me to. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have, a, so you say there's quite a few unreleased songs? Yes. Yes, there are. The, I found uh, masters all over the place, you know, and then I'm writing with uh, Billy Herzig, the songwriter. It was a friend of BJ's too. And BJ went and recorded um, a few songs with him, you know, and so I'm talking to Billy about it and he said, well, I've got some tracks on him. <laughs> you know, as you do. He recorded The Beatles, I Will. And uh, it, it's just beautiful, you know. Um, I think I found about 60 different masters. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there could be a lot of new stuff come out potentially. Yeah, yeah. I think well, and we have a source for that. You know, so I think music will continue to come out on BJ over the years. Something for all of us diehard BJ fans to look forward mm -hmm. to. That'd be great. Well, among the, all the catalog of songs, certainly those that have already been released, do you have some personal favorites? You know, I would listen to them back when it was real to real. I would listen to whatever the sessions were over and over and over again. And I grew to love a lot of songs that most people have never heard. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, they're, they're, the Billy Joe Thomas album was a masterpiece, mm -hmm. you know, and Steve Tyrell was the producer of that album. 
-hmm. and um, they did some great music together. Uh, they both were um, artists in Houston, and then um, Steve went to New York and got a job at Scepter, and then he said, look, I'm going to bring my buddy up, you know, and that's how we moved to to New York is Steve got him signed to the label. Mm -hmm. So do you have uh, a favorite memory of a different, uh, I'm sure you've played all the major music halls around the world yeah. probably, but yeah. what are some of the more exciting places that you can well, recall? You know, it was it, any place in New York was great because it's, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. That is the truth. Uh, I remember one time, uh, we were at the Exit Inn in uh, Nashville, and it just, sometimes it just comes together, and it's just memorable. Just uh, the people, the experience of it. Um, uh, it, it, was, it was a fun place for us, and he, and he was, sometimes he's always, he always did a good job. He would mm -hmm. get upset with me when I said he never hits a bad note. Um, <laughs> but he he always sound there was only about three gigs in in his that I knew of in his career where his voice was off. So sometimes when he was so tired he couldn't walk, he still sang. And then there was I can't remember the venue. It was in the Midwest. But um, it, there was weather everywhere, and he made it, and um, but the guys didn't make it. Uh -huh. So he went on stage and he started singing a cappella, and then as he was singing, you know, they started showing up. It was somewhere in the Midwest, and you know our guys don't didn't live in one place; they lived in several places. So. You know, the Atlanta guys got in and then the North Carolinas guys got in and then they'd get on stage and plug in. And that was a crazy, interesting gig. And and people just screamed and they just loved it. The great thing about the road is, is you don't know what's going to happen. And um, it's moments that are unique and only happen then that um, you, you kind of live for. You know, he did what he should do, and it was it was incredible. You know, and he's had to sing a cappella though because of sound or something like that a few times. You know. Wow. Well, the three times I got to be privileged enough to see him perform live, he was just spot on, and everybody marveled at how close to the original recordings he truly yeah. sounded. He sounded um, he sounded like his records, and that's what he wanted to do. He it wanted was very to, authentic. Yes. He wanted to, and he was down to earth and, and there wasn't, he was a professional and he was a performer, but he was an authentic um, person. He, 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 he wasn't, it was a show and he was just real. And, you know, he, he knew basically what he was going to do, but he was also very spontaneous. Who and, was he inspired by? Like, who are some of the people that he would, did you ever see him starstruck around some people or really excited or a fan of some other folks in the yeah. business? Yeah. You know, he loved Jackie Wilson, you know, and he, he loved uh, Hank Williams. And, uh, you know, his, his music taste was very diverse. Um, you know, um, he loved Billy Joel. Um you know, Obviously, he, Hank Williams was gone before his time, but did yeah. he get to ever meet any of these other musical heroes he, or play with he, them? He was a kid, and he went to a, his family took him to a Hank Williams show. Really? And uh, um, I think that's when he he realized he was going to be a singer, or he, he it struck him. He thought ah, he wanted to do that. And I think mm. he was a shy kid. You know, and he was, when when I met him, he was a shy kind of man. And um, uh, and he wasn't so much in, in his later years, but, um, you know, he would get nervous around people. Elvis was his friend, 
And, um, you know, he, he loved Elvis, you know, he loved, and when all this stuff came out about Elvis, I think he didn't understand. He thought, um, that, um, he had done such a great job and they should let him rest in peace. But I think he got it before he understood before, you know, years before he passed away. Now is BJ buried or cremated? There was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles about him passing. And it was all about him and his voice and his career and his music. And I think he was kind of brilliant in that way. Mm -hmm. He didn't want any focus to be on his um, death or his body or anything like that. Did he ever get a chance uh, to talk to you about any of the Oklahoma artists? Do you know that he ever got to work with or appreciated? Uh, well, I think um, Toby Keith, he did, um, he was on that um, show with, uh, at, in New York at Carnegie Hall. I know he got to work with Wanda Jackson on an Elvis yeah. tribute, speaking yeah. of. And he, he loved her. I love her. <laughs> you know, she's amazing. And, um, you know, he worked with her a few times and, and he, she would be at the Opry sometimes and things like that, you know, uh -huh. and, and she's an amazing woman. Um, you said Jimmy Webb, they got to work together. Yeah, He's an OP. Right. Right. He recorded, uh, a, a song called a song for my brother that uh, Jimmy wrote. And um, I think I think they took like 200 takes because Jimmy had a certain thing he was gonna do on the keyboards, on the piano, and, um, and it had to be perfect. And you, do you remember Song For My Brother? And I how do. That, that yeah. piano part is, and I know that it was, pretty hard for our guys to, to, to learn it, that BJ loved that song and he loved his brother. And I think you know, Vince Gill was on the living room sessions, right? Yes, yes. And we've worked with and around Vince over the years, you know, a bunch. You know, you end up, um, you know, they're kind of like family. Everybody's kind of like family. You just, you know, you don't see them unless it's a reunion. Right. You know, yeah. Like so of all the, you know, I've had different ones explained to me about some of the cool things or the exciting things for them that they got to do. Sometimes it was being in a, in the Macy's Day Parade or was, just some of these iconic things. Was there something that was just super cool that you guys got to be a part of that you thought was pretty neat? Um, well, I think there were so many things like that. He, he also... Uh, was in the Macy's Parade a few times. Um, th there were so many things. You know, he it was at the White House during uh, the Reagan era. He worked uh, the mall on uh, um, Fourth of July. And, um, you know, I could just see us in a helicopter swinging over the desert in Saudi Arabia. You know, that helicopter, I'm just like... I don't even know where how we're staying. We're we're swinging around like we're on a string, and um, those were memorable for a bunch of reasons. Um, and and uh, it, it was a real interesting gig. Um, you know, we uh, he worked for so many um, senators and. Uh, governors and that kind of thing through the years, you know. Um, Were you there know, any I, other presidents that you guys got to meet besides the Reagan administration? Jimmy Carter and um, Bush, he was there uh, for Bush and um, Bush, Bush Jr. <laughs> well, who do you think um, really cited BJ as one of their major influences. I'm sure you've been told stories over the years. Who are some artists that claim he is a big inspiration? Well, one of the things that um, um, Travis Tritt, um, before BJ passed away, a couple of years before BJ passed away, 
he said, I think we ought to uh, honor our legends before they, they're gone. And he, he talked about BJ. And uh, BJ read that, and it just made him feel wonderful, you know. Um, and a lot of people were influenced uh, by BJ. And, um, and you, we could hear it. I could hear it in, in people's voice. You know, when they first start out, and then they, you know, they move into their own group. But um, uh, I, I think he had a, a major influence on, on music. You know, it's like hooked on a feeling and raindrops and just can't help believing in most of all. And hey, won't you play another? That had the longest, uh, that is in the Guinness Book of Records for the longest song title ever. <laughs> and, you know, he, uh, he, uh, he had all of those hits. And it's a part of our American culture. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... Um, you you know his raindrops was in Spider Man, I think it was Spider Man Two, the one with uh, Toby McGuire, right? Mm -hmm. I'm so bad with names, um, but I <laughs> I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, uh, and he he's been in a you know a lot of um, his music has been in a lot of uh, uh, movies and. I know Michael Douglas used his music a lot. Michael Douglas was at the um, Carnegie Hall thing um, performance. And um, it was great. He loved meeting BJ. And, um, you know, everywhere we went, and you would think it would be on the t tip of my tongue, but everywhere we went, I saw people you know that he might be um the opening act of a big uh, country show and all those artists would be standing around the stage listening to bj mm -hmm. you know um you know he he had an influence on a lot of people a lot of artists and uh, people just love his voice if you and dion warwick you know, they were label mates for years. And I've been to so many of her shows. Her and BJ both, if you listen without the music to what they're doing in their in their throat, you know, it 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 is amazing. You know, uh, there that it's it sounds like a word, but when you break it down what they're doing with that word is incredible and beautiful. Now I had to put Dion in there too because <laughs> uh, they were they were they were great friends, you know, um, and they loved each other's voices. You know, I can see that. Well, do you have any? Uh, I'm sure you got to meet a plethora of just movie stars and stuff. Were there some favorites? Michael Douglas, you mentioned. Yeah. Well, through the years, we've met just about everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I know Dwight Yoakam was, I know Dwight loved his voice. And and he was really uh, a really nice guy. Vince Gill is such a nice man. You know, and, and the ones that I s tend to remember are the ones that are, that are down to earth and, and nice people, you know. Did and, he ever and, get to meet Travis Tritt after that, reading that uh, comment? I don't know if um, he met after that, but, you know, you're, you're, you know, you, you do a big show and everybody's there mm -hmm. and, you know, you're backstage and there's um, five dozen dressing rooms and, you know, a big <laughs> green room where everybody's hanging out and everything. And through the years, you meet everybody, mm -hmm. you know, whether you actually gig with them or not, you know, uh, you meet everyone. So it's hard well, for me to pick and, out, you know, hit Sammy Davis Jr. And we went to see Frank Sinatra on our honeymoon. I mean, on uh, when we got married, we got married in Vegas and we were um, Jose Feliciano and The Fifth Dimension. And Frank Sinatra was on the show, you know, so we went to see that show. 
anyway. I bet and that was something. It was something. And he did sh TV shows with um, Sammy Davis Jr. And, and um, you know, he had, we were married 52 years, you know, and he had a career before I met him. He had done everything. Uh -huh. You know, he had done some, uh, one of everything. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, at what point do you think, did he ever talk about this is when he knew he had really made it? Was there a defining point, you think, in his career when he said, okay, I'm really going to make it? You know, I think after Raindrops, it was a hit around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, every, you know, it was everywhere. Um, so he knew he had made it after Raindrops. Mm -hmm. But it takes, I, I, I've watched so many artists develop over the years, and it takes a while for them to be comfortable sometimes in their own skin. And I know that um, BJ had anxiety and he was anxious and, you know, and it took him, you know, maybe 20, 25 years to just be at one with all that and have peace with all of that. And um, I think that's when he felt that he had made it is when he was so comfortable. In. So what was it like when raindrops were just just exploding all over? What what that just had to be almost a surreal thing. Hardly it any song amazing. ever becomes as big as raindrops. It's raindrops, all just a very few do. I can remember we went to a um, a stadium, like a football stadium, and I can't remember where it is, but at one point, everybody had an umbrella and opened it, <laughs> you know, and he looked out um, among a sea of umbrellas, you know, and, you know, his fans uh, were always gracious and kind. They were never destructive. They were... Um, oh, you know, and, and women just loved him. And I knew we had done a good job if they did. And, um, um, you know, I, I just think there were so many, so many moments. And if he were here, he would be able to, to point out uh, the things that meant so much to him. And sometimes it would just be like if he knew this program, uh, had taken off and 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 so much good was being done he would love that you know that would be a moment for him to think that something that he did um, brought about that kind of good and he was involved in hundreds of things like that in the 50 years the 52 years that I knew him and uh, well what were some of the others that he lended his talent towards with helping charity wise? Well, there was arthritis, cancer, um, um, aging problems, you know, um, he rarely turned anything down, uh, that was for charity. You know, he, he did a percentage of his gigs were for, for, cause for wow. purpose, you know that's called the oklahoma standard it's what we say yeah. around here and it's just yeah. really something that runs uh i think in our blood we've had so many stars that are so known for that when not every star is or even if they are they just do like aids research or heart association yeah. research or something and that you don't see them diversified very much where they help very many other causes and uh, that's so much to be admired well, you know, we do this in conjunction with the Oklahoma History Center, and part of it is so that we can talk about the things that you feel like were most important to him. What uh, do you think were his crowning achievements, in your opinion? Um, all of his hit records, I, I think, all of his awards, you know, he's won so many. What I liked about him was the ease and grace that he handled the span of his career. Um, he's some, you know, cause in a career it goes up and down, you know, and you're, 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 you're it one day. And then two years later, you don't know where it is. And um, he handled all of those, um, 
ups and downs with grace and dignity. And um, I could tell that he, you know, he might have had to work through it in his younger years. He, he realized that nobody stays on top uh, forever. And then, and then he started becoming this legacy, you know, and a legacy artist. And people uh, started appreciating for his body of work and for his many years. And that he could still sing. Hmm. You know, he could still sing. That's what I watched. And that's what I appreciated about him is how the grace and dignity he had in all these stages of his life and the stages of his career. Sometimes it was hard to know the difference between our life and his career. He would tell me, he said, Gloria, you write like John Lennon. <laughs> so, you know, you're the only one on earth that would say that. And I love <laughs> you so much for that, <laughs> you know? And uh, um, he made me, um, he appreciated everything about other people too. He noticed, you know, it, he would notice qualities and could tell me, you know, I met this person and he would say, and he was, uh, you could tell he's a gentleman and he's, you know, he'd have all these things to say. And um, those were the things that I appreciated. And he, he, um, God, he had a temper. <laughs> really? <laughs> I wasn't, you, you you didn't see it often, but uh, uh. <laughs> you know, you didn't, you hardly ever saw it, but boy, if he lost it, you know, it was um, a hurricane. <laughs> well, the few times I was around him, he always seemed so laid back. So that, that appreciated. He really was a laid back guy. He uh -huh. really was. But early in his life, he was anxious and, and uh, hyper and, you know, and couldn't be still and all that kind of stuff, you know. So it's just a man maturing over the years into uh, into a, a great man. Well, of all of his he awards, that he, he was, by all accounts, I've ever understood. That's what everybody says. Of all his awards that he was given, what do you mm -hmm. think he was the most proud of? The first Grammy, you know. I mean, all of them. Uh, you know, you're on pins and needles. Uh, but the first one is like, he just couldn't believe it, you know? How and many so, did he receive over five. the course of five? five. Wow. Yeah. That is yeah. astonishing. Yes. Yes. Do you, do you think that he had a project that he really wanted to do that he didn't get around to? Yeah. Yeah, he wanted to do an R&B album. He, um, he always had a project that he was thinking about. Um, he wanted to, you know, he would hear songs. I mean, it's just like going to uh, Billy Herzig's uh, house and them working on some songs. He was a music man. You know, he, um, he was creative and inventive. And, and um, one of the things that I, I know that he had feelings about, I don't know if you'd want me to say this or not, but he would go in the studio and like Chip Smallman was the kind of producer that would allow him to just feel the music and sing it the way he sang it. And he felt like that um, he, need, he, he should have uh, producer credit because he brought life to those songs and, and not in the same way, but he, he each one was uh, a piece of art. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it, when he went into the studio, he knew a song frontwards and backwards. You know, I would know it front, frontwards and backwards because he would sing it and sing it and sing it so that he could go in and he knew, he knew what he was doing. He knew the song and he could let himself go. And when a producer like Chips would also see that in him and let him go. Um, it, it, the music was beautiful. I saw an interview once of, of Chip's moment that was done by the Country Music Hall of Fame. And uh -huh. he just gave like one word answers to every yeah. single question. I, I actually emailed the interviewer and said, I feel so sorry for you. That just had to be brutal. 
Did you ever get to spend much time around him? He was kind of a mystery yeah. man, I think. Yeah, I, I, a lot of time, you know, we, we did, you know, we, BJ recorded off and on. We record, it's one of the unreleased albums. He went in the studio with Chips like 10 or, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and, but he, he's not like that around other people. Uh -huh. You know, he, he was, he's funny and, and he was kind, but uh, um, to us, you know, but he, he didn't have a lot to say with, with people he didn't know. Yeah. Well, what an extraordinary genius he was behind oh, the, the music board. He, Dusty yeah. Uh, Springfield and Son of a Preacher yeah. Man and the Elvis yeah. Suspicious Minds and he yeah. produced the Highwaymen later in life. I mean, just so many credits to his production. A good producer recognizes when someone is, has, has nailed it, you know, right. and so, but he, he gave artists so much freedom. You know, he has worked with uh, some of the best musicians ever, you know, in New York and uh, Leland with the wrecking uh, with the uh, the wrecking crew. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all um, the legendary, all yeah. the legendary groups. Yeah. Well, no doubt, a credit to the the sound that, that he so exemplified that became a signature sound for him, if you will. Uh -huh. And um, you've been so generous with your time, and I knew oh, this was you. the first interview that you've done since he's passing. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. He he appeared to really embrace his uh, lung cancer bravely. He did. And, uh, I he appreciate did. that he just went straight forward to his fans. I'd been following him for years on social yeah. media. And yeah. You know, I am the one that didn't realize he was going to die. Right up until two weeks, I just knew he was going to get through it. You know, and uh, a drummer a, a triple scale drummer in New York, Alan Schwartzberg. I ended up with Big Dot Records, but um, you know, he said, it, and when I called him and said that BJ was gone, he said, Gloria, you said, and I said, Alan, I couldn't, I couldn't see him. I couldn't see him leaving, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, I guess that was God's way of taking care of you, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, See, it's still painful, you know. But I'm yeah. where he planned to be. He would have loved it here. I love it here. <laughs> and, um, you know, life is normal again, and, and I'm moving forward, you know. And, but you know, there was no way to do this interview any sooner. And, uh, well, totally understandable. Yeah. And well, I'm so grateful that you did it. And and just wrapping it up, uh, this of course would be very close and personal to you. But how would you like B.J. Thomas to be remembered? As the best singer you've ever heard. He was, you know, I never got bored. You know, I went to a thousand shows. And there are some people like his fan club president that went to more than me. Um, and he just always, he always brought something unique to every performance. It, you know, he was um, the best singer. I know was, there are others that is good, but he, you know, I, I like a lot of songs. I love songs, but for me, there's only one singer. He's hard to beat, that's for sure. And he's yeah. a source of Oklahoma pride. And we uh, offer our deepest condolences to you and your daughters for your loss. It's a big hole in your world and a huge loss to the music industry. And we thank you for being a part of Oklahoma Shine On Music Series, where we get to talk about the legendary Grammy Award winner, Oklahoma Music Hall of Famer, B.J. Thomas. And Gloria, thank you so much for being a part of this interview.